Hello, everyone. Welcome to Small Biz Tips. So I was on LinkedIn a few weeks ago and just browsing LinkedIn and I stumble across somebody's profile. I'm like, wait a second, this guy buying SaaS companies. Huh? I want to know more about this. So I reached out and he replied <laughs> and I'm like, well, good. So I'm excited to have um, this gentleman here. I'm excited to hear about how he's buying all these SaaS companies. Andrew, what's going on, man? Hey, happy to be here. So um, yeah, just a quick introduction. I'm Andrew. Uh, I co-founded a company called Exo Capital. Um, mm -hmm. To call it private equity is like pretty grandiose. We're quite a small little team of five people full time. And we've just been using our own um, our own dollars so far to buy really, really small companies. So nice. when people say small companies, that sometimes means to some people like a $10 million a year business. To us, uh -huh. it means like somebody doing like a couple hundred bucks a month, right? Or like a thousand dollars of recurring revenue. So we bought quite small businesses. And over the past three years, we've bought 10 so far. Nice. Um, we've sold four. We currently operate six. And um, we've slowly been increasing the size and uh, the, the scale that we're operating at. So um, we bought, you know, the first one three years ago for mm -hmm. only 25,000. And wow. um, the most the most recent one we bought was for around 800. So we're um, slowly increasing. But uh, yeah, kind of looking forward, we're um, looking to figure out like what's next for us and and how to bring in outside investors to kind of scale up what we're doing. Cause we feel like we've got a cool little model, but um, I don't want to confuse anyone by thinking that we're some huge private equity company. This is, this is a very small thing we've put together, very achievable. I think for a lot of people to, to replicate if they wanted to not easy, but uh, very yeah, doable. Cool. I love it. I love it because you hear all these super grandiose $4 billion, a hundred million dollar deals but you don't hear about the smaller deals. And I think that what you're doing is amazing. And I'm curious, how did you even get into this? <laughs> so uh, I was the CTO of a venture studio. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with what a venture studio is? Tell us more. So basically a venture studio is a, a kind of an incubator. So our mm -hmm. version of that was, and I wasn't a co-founder at this company. I was just a hired gun. But mm -hmm. our version was we raised about three million bucks to do three companies. And okay. so the idea is you build three companies kind of in parallel. You see which one works and you kill the, the losers and you double oh. down on the winners, right? So in theory, this is like every entrepreneur's dream. Yeah. You get to place <laughs> many bets at once. You get to switch between projects. Uh -huh. In reality, it's a terrible idea. Of course, there are exceptions. So I'm based in LA and out here we have like science. So they did a dollar shape above. And there's a, there's a couple notable exceptions. Yeah. So of course it has worked for some people, yeah. but almost everyone I've ever spoken to that's tried to do a venture studio uh, wouldn't do it again. I'll put it that way. So okay. our venture studio had one kind of winner and I ended up becoming CTO of that company. We raised about 8 million bucks. It was like a five-year journey. We spent mm -hmm. a little more than that and it went to zero. Mm -hmm. And my lesson from that was, I mean, amongst, amongst many things was, yeah. um, I think that there's a, there's an easier way to do this. This is the venture thing is, is a very specific type of path. And I don't know about you, but if you look on like TechCrunch or my information diet throughout my twenties was all about unicorns and VC and venture. And mm -hmm. that's what a startup is. And after this company kind of, you know, fizzled out, I looked around and found people like Andrew Wilkinson, Tiny Capital doing these smaller acquisitions. So it was something smaller than private equity. I mean, and Tiny Capital is like actually not tiny anymore, but they were at one point, right? Um, and the idea that you could buy revenue to start out with was just a very compelling idea because for me, I'm technical, my background's in engineering. And so mm -hmm. my blind spot is actually, um, do people want this thing? So I can build it, right? I yeah. can build whatever, but it's, it's, do people want it? And so it was sort of a hack to be able to buy something, even if it's doing just a few thousand dollars a month for me to circumvent my own nearsightedness mm -hmm. or, or my own blind spots in entrepreneurship where I can um, just acquire the customers and the product and a path Okay. Uh, and and not have to guess so much about what should I go build. Mm. So uh, I like 
that you're doing that because a lot of software engineers don't think like that. They just say, oh, I, I could build it myself. You think, oh, why don't I find something that's already working and make it better? <laughs> yeah, because, uh, well, first of all, if you get punched in the gut enough times, you'll start thinking a little differently. And so <laughs> I feel like after I got a huge, you know, crack to the head, I was like, okay, I think maybe I should start thinking about this slightly differently. But the thing is, yes, of course, I t if I take a look at an early stage company, somebody that's been working on something for a year, you know, maybe this is like everyone thinking they're an above average driver, but yes, I could build their product, but that is not a business, right? Yeah. The business is all the blog posts, all the marketing, all of the learnings that went into getting those first few customers, all the nuances of why this is posi positioned exactly here, just a sort of combined magic for why something is working and a competitor is not, or I don't know if you follow kind of the indie hackers community, but oftentimes somebody will launch, get some traction, and then 10 clones pop up. This has happened to me before. And the, the, the clones eventually die. And the reason is they took at face value, the engineer's mindset of I can copy this, therefore mm -hmm. I will have this business. And that's just not true. You still mm -hmm. have to build trust. You still have to acquire the audience. You still have to retain people and keep people happy. And what does customer support look like? There's just a whole world outside of just the engineering piece of a software company so you mentioned something earlier about your first acquisition was 25 grand yes tell, tell us more about that you know what was that process like and what was some of your biggest lessons from that so i went on indie hackers and twitter and i just said like does anyone on planet earth want to buy a company with me and we'll just do one or two to experiment with I found two gentlemen who courageously wired money to me and we put it all in like an LLC together wow. and we bought a company called screenshot API and yeah. we're still holding this company today. It's like a great little thing. Um, it was making $500 a month and it had been around for about a year. Um, wow. And we bought it for about 25 grand and today it's doing about 5,000 a month. Wow. And, um, it's been a, it's been a great, it's been a great little journey, but yeah, we used our initial three acquisitions purely as, as our mini MBA, as a, as a, let's learn how to do this. Are we any good at this, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to bring in partners because, um, I at the time did not, and you know, nobody wants to lose 25 grand, but <laughs> I was like, okay, I could lose, you know, 8,000 if I bring in a couple other partners and just be like, okay, well, I at least learned something. I wanted to get $8,000 worth of learning. And even if this one thing went to zero, I accepted that risk. And so that was sort of the, the mental math I did in my head before jumping in. So what did you find that company? <laughs> I um, am not afraid to hustle people on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever. So this was slightly before micro acquire now acquire.com was mm -hmm. a thing. And there's, there's, there were marketplaces and there still are like biz buy sell and flip there are all these yeah. other sites, but I personally would go on those kind of older sites and look at it and be like, these aren't like my people, these aren't companies I want to buy. Like, I don't want to buy this, you know, blog that, you know, is for like, I don't know, hikers in Milwaukee. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like weird stuff was for sale. I was like, I want to buy just a little SaaS company. Mm. And so I found this guy on uh, Indie Hackers. He had posted his revenue and I said, can we buy this thing? That's um, awesome. And that's, that's still our pitch today. When I go out and I find cool companies, my pitch is still today. And it's true. It's, it's like, I'm sure the timing is not right, but if you ever think about selling, let me know. And we get plenty of, of inbound requests now for people that um, are, are looking to sell or exploring selling. So uh, I want to go a little bit further though, when it comes to analyzing the smaller SaaS company, what, what, what's like your process? So, we try and so when we're buying an initial company, what are we really buying? So we're buying like a customer list, a few customers. Mm -hmm. um, the more the better, right? For us, it's very comfortable when we see like a hundred plus customers, even if they're at only like 10 or 20 bucks a month each. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't like customer concentration. We've bought a more enterprise SaaS with like six customers or seven customers. And mm -hmm. for our operating model, it's just really stressful to have to, um, handhold each of those customers whereas with when you have like a hundred that are smaller um you can you can apply a more like product-led growth playbook but all that might we might touch on later so essentially we're buying a customer list of some kind 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're buying a product that's in some state less than complete. So 80% <laughs> complete, 90% complete, but it's certainly not going to be 100% complete. Um, and ideally, we're buying one channel that is working. So that channel for us could be paid uh, mm -hmm. or it could be earned. It could be all anything as long as we see one channel where that, that particular entrepreneur found their initial customer base. And a lot of times it is like posting on Reddit and doing all these, yeah. you know, those kind of like one off activities. But we want to see the start at least of like, you know, we can convert people from Google ads or we can convert people from, you know, of course, everybody wants 100% direct traffic, but yeah. finding finding that deal is, is tough. So th that's really what we're buying is those three things, a channel, customer list, and, and the code base. So what happened after you buy the business? Because, you know, does that, because normally for something like that, it's normally that one guy in a VA and sometimes it's just that one guy. So does that yes. guy stayed on or how does that part work? So that's sort of the jumping off point. Most of these uh, entrepreneurs want to move on. That's the reason yeah. they're selling. This thing they thought was maybe on the venture track isn't, and mm -hmm. they're not interested in kind of pushing that rock uphill. So when we acquire it, generally speaking, there might be some contractors that we'll keep on. So we've bought stuff that has an engineer that is a contractor. And so we might continue to use that, that individual for engineering efforts. But most of the time, yeah, the entrepreneur leaves. There's maybe 30 days where we ask them a bunch of questions. Um, thankfully, I'm technical. And so I go and do the technical diligence and really get an understanding for uh, what kind of nightmare I'm getting into. <laughs> And um, most of the time, I really just want to know uh, where the bodies are buried and because mm -hmm. um, every code base has them. And uh, that's part of our, our kind of acquisition process is, is dealing with entrepreneurs that are that kind of transparent. It makes the whole process go really quickly. But um, yeah, we're just looking for essentially some kind of angle, some kind of um, play that we can apply over the next, let's say, two years that's going to double the business, for instance. Gotcha. So let's fast forward, right? Your biggest transaction you said is 800K. Did you guys use your own money? Did you do kind of like a creative financing? Kind of give us a, walk us through that process. So a lot of our acquisitions have some kind of seller financing component. Um, so in this case, we did have some seller financing component. It was like 20% of the purchase price, 25% um, of the purchase price, and the rest was cash. Um, but that's pretty common is to have some kind of holdout where we'll, we'll yeah. ask if we can do any kind of seller financing. The <clears throat> At face value, everybody loves seller financing. You as the buyer, you want to go buy a business, seller financing, seller financing. So great. So great. <laughs> so it is, right? It is a lot of times you can structure it as an interest-free loan. The problem is if you look at your uh, cash flow mm. after like net of that debt payment, there's really not that much money left over. So it makes mm -hmm. that initial period where you have that seller financing like pretty tight. So mm -hmm. if you have 18 months of seller financing, plan to uh, have those first 18 months like really suck because you awesome. don't have enough money to really pay full-time people to do full-time work, right? You have to kind of piece it together, which is why currently our operating models, we have three full-time developers, one full-time customer support person, and they rotate between projects because each one of those projects is generally speaking too small to afford to staff like a full-time gotcha. engineer and a full-time CEO. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, what's the vision for Exo Capital now? Where do you guys see taking this? Because, you know, you've acquired 10 businesses, you've sold some, like what's the vision for you in like, okay, three years, this is where I want this to be. So we're going to start, a uh, new concept we're calling flip funds. Uh, okay. This will be our way of allowing other people to invest alongside us as we do this. So we've done 10 over the past three years. I think mm -hmm. we'll do five to 10 of these flip fund type models. <clears throat> because in the past, I went out and tried to raise and assign a value to our entire entity with all the portfolio yeah. companies. And that was, that was a little tricky because the difference between hiring um, sorry, not hiring, but having people invest in a company and they're just buying shares and you're using the money to grow versus mm -hmm. using all of those dollars to acquire a new business. If you trace that logic out, we would be just diluted to almost nothing. So it's like a very funky model to try mm -hmm. and grow. And normal funds, the time horizon sucks. It's like 10 to 12 years, sometimes longer. Yeah. 
people don't want to lock their money up for that long, or at least they don't with us. And so this flip fund concept is sort of a fun take on that, where we're saying we're going to buy one company. So you invest in one LLC, you put your money in one LLC, we, we get all the investors in that same um, in that same LLC, we'll buy one company, we'll try and double it in 12 to 24 months, and that's it. So even if we're leaving money on the table, even if this thing is like, you know, maybe if it's like a stratospheric hit, right, we can deal yeah. with those great upside potential situations later. But the idea is generally speaking a fund, but with just like a two year life cycle. And even the, the term fund is a slight misnomer because there's only we're only acquiring one company. Gotcha. Gotcha. Wow. Um, I'm curious in that process of buying these businesses, selling some of them, what were your you know, your three biggest challenge? The shared operating model sucks. Um, the real solution, and this is the answer to why everybody in our spot eventually moves upstream to buy bigger businesses, because frankly, once you start reaching a certain threshold, you can hire dedicated people full-time to that business. And I'm yeah. not saying that's easy, right? You just have different problems. You have to find the right people, make sure they're doing you know, a great job, but mostly just finding the right people is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Finding operators is just really, really hard. Um, but that uh, shared operating model sucks. And I would much rather trade that problem set for finding a great operator to then place at the helm. And then there's some leftover capital for them to at least hire at least one full-time engineer gotcha. to go um, continue working on it. So that's why we're trying to, with the fund, raise and buy slightly bigger businesses so that we can find a great operator, find great engineers, staff them, uh, mm -hmm. and dedicate them just to that one project and really increase velocity and lower our operational burden when we when we acquire new companies. That's mm -hmm. the first one. Yeah, that's probably the biggest problem. Okay. I'm glad you kind of figure out how you're going to solve it. <laughs> because... So, all right. Um... Wow, because let's kind of wrap things up, right? Because we, I'm looking at the time, we're running out of time here. Um, because you've been in that space for the past three years, you've seen, you know, the bad, the good, the ugly, everything, right? What would you say to a small business owner who said, you know what, I'm thinking about acquiring a business. As a matter of fact, I should acquire a SaaS business and incorporate it in what we're doing. You know, what what would you say to them? What would be that your small biz tips to that person? So. It's a different strategy if you have a current business, right? So the, the businesses that we acquire don't necessarily have anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're an existing business owner and you have some kind of product line, whether it's software or offline, and you want to complement your existing business, right? A bolt-on acquisition, mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a very viable way to grow, right? So you have a company that does, sells to developers and you want to acquire another developer tool that you can then sell to your existing um, mm -hmm. customer base. That's an excellent strategy. Another excellent strategy is just a simple roll-up strategy. So as everybody knows, you, know, you're hired, you have an accounting firm. Uh, yeah. You can go buy another accounting firm in the county over and acquire those customers and you've just doubled your revenue. Um, and what's great about buying non-software businesses is there's all kinds of real financing options. Whereas mm -hmm. for us, we've gone through the SBA process a number of times with a number yeah. of different deals. And the reality is getting SBA money to do software acquisitions is still very challenging, despite what everyone on Twitter will tell you or wow. um, all the things you might have read it is still just very challenging. They want a very pristine, very clean LLC with very, very clean financials. And it just is like very challenging to find a company that meets all of their kind of weird needs. Because again, there's no assets in a software company, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no tangible well, assets. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good, good, good. So if somebody wants to do business with you, maybe they have a software company they're looking to sell. Um, how do they get in touch with you? Um, how do you determine, okay, this is something I want to buy? So our buy box currently, we're trying to find stuff that's at least doing 10000 a month up to about okay. 50000 a month. That's kind of roughly where we're looking. Uh, it's only B2B SaaS uh, and it has to be product-led growth. And so by that, I mean, there's some kind of like freemium component. There is no click here to book a call with a salesperson, right? Yeah. There is none of that. Um, we just can't support hiring salespeople to, um, to further those efforts in our current shared services model. So that's roughly our buy box. But 
yeah, if anybody's interested, you can check us out at exo.capital mm-hmm. uh, or I'm pretty active on, on Twitter at Andrew Pierno, P-I-E-R-N-O. Fantastic, Andrew. Thank you for chiming on. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and knowledge in the space. And guys, definitely reach out to Andrew if you're thinking about selling one of your SaaS business. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.